AC3 Digital says, I'll probably get downvoted for this and that's okay, but I don't respect him too much. During COVID, he started his informative videos on YouTube, which was great. A lot of people did and did that for continued learning and information sharing. But then he started charging for them. An entire industry was shut down. Thousands of people lost their livelihoods overnight. And he decided there's a good time to charge those very same people money to share his insight. In my opinion, that was pretty low down. Everyone I knew was looking for ways to help each other, not profit off of each other. On the flip side, practicalshow.tech offers dozens of amazing webinars fully free of charge on a wide variety of topics as a way to pass time and share their collective wealth. I've also been to a show he was mixing. He was pushing 130 dB at front of house. It was just too loud and it sounded just sounded bad. He was asked by the venue to pull it back and refused. Just my personal opinions based on those limited interactions. Wow, that's fun stuff. I never stopped making the public videos. I just did more. And why did I start the member side? It's a troll barrier. They can't get past it. I've also been to a show he was mixing and he was pushing 130 dB. No one would be there if it's 130 dB, 10. I find 130 dB not a believable number. Uh, I'm guessing this is referring to Red Rocks. And at Red Rocks, the volume limit had been made more stringent due to a base nectar show. I devised a little way to get some room with the low end. And what I did is I set some subwoofers up at front of house, time aligned them out of polarity, and set them at a very low volume such that it canceled out the low end at the measurement mic and allowed higher volume. Uh, what I'm guessing is that Fun little antic, gets blown out of proportion a little bit, exaggerated over time, memories drift, and it somehow got to 130 dB. Um, couldn't get there, if it even if I wanted to get to 130 dB, couldn't. But um, yeah, it's a good story. I don't mind um, having a reputation for being the loudest show ever to exist, even if it's not true. Come on, people, lighten up. It's not like we're saving lives with heart attacks and stuff like that. We make sound. We're in this business to have fun. We spread happiness, joy, communication. We connect the artist with the audience. This is a dream adventure. There's no, what, what is the reason for being an asshole? Why take this so seriously? Help people out, understand stuff and learn as much as you can about this wonderful and beautiful invisible field of audio we live and work in. Um, Josh Mellow Mix says, he comes off as an old school guy. Worked with plenty. Took a long time to muster the courage to tell dudes like that they're wrong about something. Some of his info seems to imply he is lacking a some fundamental. He is lacking a some fundamental knowledge that would probably make a lot of his rig setup pointless. If you're going to put me somewhere, I would put me off on some extreme of experimental, trying new things, doing things different ways that other people don't do them. Old school infers that I'm doing things the good old way, like putting overheads way up high like a recording studio and then trying to do a live gig like that because they're just room mics over the drums because there's nothing we need more than a bunch of room sound getting into those overhead mics so that we can amplify that room sound back into the same room we're already in because rooms are not echoey and resonant enough for us. We need more. All right. Um, yeah, lacking some knowledge and information. Um, Cool Josh Mellow mix. Uh, he's an appalling mixer, says Save the Wolf. He only has so much fame because he owns a big PA company with his name in the title. 
His terrible ray trap homemade boxes are still dotted around LA from before he became an and eloquistics dealer. If you are unlucky, you might mix on some. Save the wolf. Um, appalling mixer. All right. Well, thank you. Um, you know, it's good when you see someone just take a random, hey, he's a, a save the wolf is, a, you know, as licks farts or something, you know, it's just, it, it's, it, it kind of discounts the whole credibility of the statement. Um, he has so much fame because he owns a big PA with his company name at the time. My name is not Dave Rat. People call me Dave Rat because of the company. So actually it went the other way. The company got popular and people started referring to me by the company name. Uh, Rat stands for Reliable Audio Technology, by the way. And um, I have fame because the company, the company has fame because, uh, you know, I've been designing building stuff since uh, 1980 when I left Hughes Aircraft. I was working there testing, doing environmental tests on tow missile systems, and I quit to do the build sound systems at 18 years old and been doing it ever since. That's a credibility drop there. So just to kind of throw that out there. His terrible ray trap home box. You know, there's somebody with an axe to grind. It really doesn't, um, there's no real reason to bother with that. TJ Occultus. Can't say on the hanging, but I believe the primary problem was way too much processing and they were either underpowered or trimmed back so far by processing that it was awful. I remember doing Irvine Meadows with something like 20 K2s. My desk was in the red and it was like 99 dB at front of house. Uh, this is back to the, this is the, um, TJ Coltis was having trouble getting sound, good sound out of an L acoustics rig. But uh, yeah, Irvine Meadows had a pretty strict limit. And I'm um, guessing that 99 dB at front of the house was an uh, exaggeration. And that um, it was running into the noise limitations. That makes sense. Now I understand a little bit more about why TJ Occultis was unhappy with the L Acoustics rig. Um, K Dash Groot. I get the idea, but I don't agree. As a front of house engineer, I trust the system engineer to have done the best of his or her abilities to create equal response throughout the location. That leaves me up to make the mix as good as I can and I can get that hopefully gets transferred to as much of the audience as possible. If I'm, for lack of a better word, splitting a mix to left and right submix, I'm now mixing two separate mixes for the same audience. All of their physical positions assume front of house is center, and that's unable to hear either the one. Um, that's unable to hear either one of them isolated. I could go wrong, but that sounds to me like mixing blind. I appreciate that, K. Groot, as an engineer. Um, now, I actually started as a system tech. I, the first thing I did was I designed and built sound systems, then went from designing building sound systems to renting them out. And as a rental company, bands would come without engineers. I learned to mix on the systems because we needed someone to do it. I never set out to be a sound engineer. I'm a sound system designer. I love building things. I came out of the aerospace industry uh, I have patents. This is what I really do. Um, I was PA tech for Pearl Jam and Sonic Youth and um, many uh, and other bands. I was pro I was a PA tech as my primary um, gig, and over time, and then as a PA tech, I would mix the support acts and I would start to mix um, artists that didn't carry um, engineers and. Then I learned to mix. And then as a sound engineer, I just kept getting hired. I turned down being an engineer. Um, I had a sound company to run. Being an engineer away from the PA was not in my world. Finally, bands started hiring me as an engineer and the sound system, so I decided to go. So it came from the other side of things. As a PA tech and as an engineer, optimizing these things above and beyond what the norm is has become something fascinating and wonderful and pushing things to new limits, testing new subwoofer configurations, testing new ways of doing it, modern deployments of multiple systems. That 
is really what interests me. Mixing the band was um, kind of the testing ground and something fun to do. Cool. Oh, for lack of a better word, splitting between. Yeah, mixing multiple things. Mixing a recording in ears, mixing the live sound, mixing left different, different than right. Those are all challenges and they do take up uh, mental space. And as you increase your skill set, you'll be able to take on more and more of that and be able to mix several things and keep track of all of them and know how they interact and which one affects which other one. Um, but that's part of just time and effort and perfecting your craft.